Hello, my name is Dr. Andrea Kostler, and I am Associate Professor of Ophthalmology at the Stanford University School of Medicine, and I'm the Director of Oculofacial Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery and Orbital Oncology at the Byers Eye Institute at Stanford in California. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this discussion on thyroid eye disease, an evolving continuum of care. And it is my pleasure to have an international panel with two friends and colleagues. Uh, the first is Dr. Mario Salvi. He is the head of the Center of Graves Orbitopathy in Milan, Italy, and a consultant endocrinologist at the Department of Clinical and Community Sciences at the University of Milan. And I've had an opportunity to visit Dr. Salvi at the University of Milan, and I'm so excited to have him with us today. Next, we have Dr. Edsel Ng. He is professor and chair of ophthalmology and visual sciences at the University of Alberta, and also professor of ophthalmology at the University of Toronto, Canada. And again, another friend, an expert in thyroid eye disease. So excited to have both of them here with us today. We're gonna start our first educational module, understanding the mechanism of thyroid eye disease and who is at risk. First, let's get into the pathophysiology of the disease. And looking at this slide, you can see it is actually quite complex. But thyroid eye disease is characterized by inflammation, volume expansion, and remodeling of the orbital and periorbital tissues, with the key player of this disease being the orbital fibroblast. The orbital fibroblast has antigens on its cell membrane, the TSH receptor and the IGF-1 receptor, that co-localize together. When our body recognizes these antigens as foreign, it can start this inflammatory response where we can have adipocyte proliferation, myofibroblast proliferation, orbital fibroblast proliferation, and the secretion of cytokines and hyaluronan and other inflammatory products that can result in orbital soft tissue expansion, bulging of the eyes, double vision, and even loss of vision. It has been said that the natural history of thyroid eye disease involves an active inflammatory phase that can last anywhere from six months to up to five years. Typically, patients will have pain, redness, and swelling that will progress over time. And patients will eventually plateau into a static phase where the inflammation subsides, and eventually they'll move into this inactive phase where this is characterized by oftentimes fibrosis, and the sequela of the disease persists, although the inflammation subsides. It's been quoted that up to 16% of patients can have reactive deprivation of disease long after the patient has moved into the inactive phase of the disease. Now, there are many treatment options for thyroid eye disease, and we're not gonna get into it too deeply here, but I would be remiss not to mention that when patients have mild disease, we wanna treat them conservatively by lubricating their ocular surface and minimizing risk factors for progression of disease. When patients have moderate to severe disease, there are many medical therapies that have been reported to be effective for this disease, including steroids, radiation, and biologics. And then finally, site-threatening disease is an emergency, and these patients can be treated with high-dose steroids or surgery or other medical therapies. When patients have inactive disease, typically we're treating these patients with surgical rehabilitation. However, a phase four study did demonstrate that tepertibumab can be effective in proptosis reduction in these patients as well. We're gonna move into the panel discussion, and I'm gonna to talk to my esteemed colleagues here, Dr. Salvi and Dr. Ng. Uh, I'm gonna throw the first question over to you, uh, Mario. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about the link between Graves' disease and thyroid eye disease. Well, I mean, certainly thyroid eye disease is associated to Graves' disease because most patients have an underlying thyroid disease, which is hyperthyroidism, and this is caused by uh, these TSH receptor-directed antibodies, which produce hyperthyroidism and do have some uh, stimulation also the fibroblasting of the orbit. Uh, so the link is very, very close, although we do not understand very well everything about this link. We know, for example, that there are some patients uh, who do not have any eye sign despite having maybe an ongoing thyroiditis, uh, sorry, a Graves hyperthyroidism, which is even, you know, sometimes not easy to control with therapy. And we also do have some patients who have thyroid eye disease associated to another form of autoimmune thyroid disorder, which is Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which behaves certainly different since it's mostly a hypothyroid, hypothyroid disease. 
Um, so the link is probably related to some immune mechanism, certainly driven in good in a good part by the TSH receptors antibodies, but some unknowns that still are, need to be studied. Certainly, there are many unknowns still with thyroid eye disease, but we do know that thyroid eye disease is the most common extraocular or extrathyroidal manifestation of Graves' disease, but certainly not everybody develops the eye findings when they have a thyroid dysfunction. I'm going to send the next question to you, Ed. Uh, tell us a little bit about the main risk factors for developing thyroid eye disease, and are any of these risk factors modifiable? Well, thanks, Andrea. So uh, cigarette smoking is the most important modifiable risk factor, uh, but things like thyroid dysfunction, both hyper and hypothyroidism, elevated thyrotropin receptor antibodies, and one do active iodine therapy if not accompanied by low-dose steroid prophylaxis. Uh, family history, increasing age, uh, and uh, female gender are associated more with thyroid-associated orbitopathy, but I do see the worst disease in male smokers in my practice. Um, an interesting uh, development uh, in the last five to 10 years is in uh, MS treatment for chronic relapsing MS. The drug alemtuzumab uh, can cause uh, apparently thyroid associated orthopathy in up to 30% of patients. Very interesting. And we know how important it is for us to work with our endocrinology colleagues as they're oftentimes seeing these patients very early in disease and they can help us to manage some of the systemic. Uh, conditions that can put our patients at risk. So Mario, I'm going to throw it over to you. What main risk factors are you recognizing for thyroid eye disease and um, are they modifiable and, and what are you doing to decrease their risk? Well, the, the modifiable uh, risk factors are certainly thyroid dysfunction. I mean, we know that uh, controlling, normalizing thyroid function is important for the uh, progression of the disease. So avoiding especially hyperthyroidism or even hypothyroid. So monitoring, close monitoring of thyroid function is essential. Other modified risk factor is uh, uh, if you are convincing enough to uh, ask patient to stop or refrain from mm -hmm. smoking, certainly we know that smokers have a more, I would say, rebel thyroid eye disease in the sense that they're more resistant to treatment and they certainly are more prone to develop more severe forms. Other risk factors that are not modifiable are certainly the age and sex. We know that the presentation of diseases changes uh, with age, and there, uh, the, for example, the proportion of female to male tends to uh, become less strong. I mean, usually the, the females have prevailing disease compared to male, but this difference tends to be less strong with advancing age, especially in middle age. So, and this we can't do anything, unfortunately, about. But certainly, one I think is important to, to do in terms of, of uh, risk factor is uh, to, in, in a way, to prevent the disease is really to suggest patients to uh, report very, very quickly whatever eye symptoms they have, because that is, allows us to come in very strongly. Um, you know, we know that mild disease you mentioned before is something usually treated with conservative measures, and but there are studies who have shown that some supplementation with selenium may help in, in reducing the progression of the disease. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And in my patients that have mild disease, I think there's a lot of education that's important in assessing for their risk factors and working with endocrinology and our other colleagues to monitor their thyroid dysfunction and to talk to them about smoking cessation and other things like checking their vitamin D, seeing if they need selenium supplementation, and evaluating them for things like diabetes or having high cholesterol, sleep apnea, et cetera. There's a lot of these risk factors, and we try to um, help to minimize those modifiable ones. And then finally, we have one more question, and uh, Mara, I'm going to stick with you on this one. Is there any correlation between the level of autoantibodies and thyroid eye disease activity and severity? Well, certainly there, there is uh, data, evidence that um, uh, the, uh, both activity and severity do relate to higher titers of TSA receptor antibodies. Whether they are totally pathogenic or not, we discussed before, we, we don't really know for, for sure, but we do know that more severe forms of hyperthyroidism do present with thyroid eye disease and usually in more severe forms. And I think that this is important in terms of, especially a diagnosis, when if patients do have a Graves hyperthyroidism, 
and they have elevated T3 to TSH receptor antibodies, but no eye signs. I think these are the patients who have to be more closely monitored because they are more prone, certainly, to develop the eye disease later on. Great. And Ed, what's your opinion on that? Um, uh, thyroid associated orthopedopathy is a clinical diagnosis guided by lab tests. So things like thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin, thyroid peroxidase antibody, thyroglobulin antibody, and, and serum IGF-1 levels at present, they, they just don't seem consistent. Um, but, to, you know, the future with, with blood, tear, and urine biomarkers, um, maybe we'll find uh, the, you know, some magic uh, a predictor for the clinical course of thyroid-associated orbitop. So we can allow our, our labs, like our thyroid-stimulating immunoglobulin, to guide us. And, and I, I do agree that sometimes there can be a correlation of activity and severity, but yet it can be unreliable. Uh, it's been wonderful talking about this with you and, and discussing uh, how the, back, the pathophysiology of thyroid eye disease and, and how we can best identify thyroid eye disease in our patients. This concludes the educational module, and it's been wonderful talking with you today. In the second educational module, we will be discussing the clinical presentation of thyroid eye disease. We'll talk about what the signs and symptoms are for thyroid eye disease. First, let me just get into some of the common signs and symptoms. Most patients with thyroid eye disease are gonna first present with ocular surface signs and symptoms, and so they may present to their ophthalmologist. We know that about 65 to 85% of patients with thyroid eye disease also have dry eye symptoms. And this can include things like pain, redness, tearing, burning. These patients oftentimes have inflammation in their lacrimal gland, and this can affect their tear production. They can also have inflammation on the conjunctiva above their cornea, and we call that superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis. Oftentimes patients can have difficulty with eyelid closure or blinking, which can cause their cornea to be exposed. And if very severe, this could result in a scratch of the cornea, an infection, even a corneal ulcer or perforation. Another extremely common thing that we see in our patients is eyelid retraction. This occurs in up to 90% of patients that have thyroid eye disease, and it's very aesthetically bothersome. Patients can look like they're staring. The white sclera is exposed. Uh, when they try to look down, the eyelid can lag behind, and this can impact their ability to blink or close their eyes, and then this can lead to pain of the ocular surface. Another common presenting sign or symptom is proptosis. Proptosis is when there is hypertrophy of fat or muscle or even just uh, edema and fluid which can push the globe forward. This can cause the cornea to be exposed. It can cause increased pressure inside the eye, and it can be aesthetically bothersome and even disfiguring. Another very common presenting sign is double vision. This occurs in about 50% of our patients. The extraocular muscles can get very swollen and enlarged, and this can result in difficulty in moving the eyes, and patients will experience double vision or diplopia. And then later in the uh, course of the disease, the fluid and inflammation can transition into scar tissue and fibrosis. And again, these patients can have double vision, which can be very challenging to treat, both medically and surgically. And then when all of these things are combined and the muscles enlarge and the fluid expands the orbital soft tissues, the optic nerve can be compressed or stretched, and this can result in vision loss. This is one of the more severe and concerning final signs and symptoms of thyroid eye disease. Another thing that can happen is the cornea can be so exposed that the cornea can break down, also leading to decreased vision. So now that we've talked a little bit about these signs and symptoms and things that we really want to monitor in our patients in clinic, let's talk a little bit about the burden of the disease and these signs and symptoms um, and how we can recognize them so that we can properly diagnose this disease. And so I'm gonna turn back to uh, my friends here, my esteemed panel, Ed and Mario. And we have about four questions here. Um, let's get into the first one. What are the key first signs of thyroid eye disease? 
that can prompt early detection. And I'm gonna throw this one to Mario, because in, as an endocrinologist, you are seeing these patients that have Graves' disease and thyroid dysfunction, and you're treating them very regularly in your clinic. How do you recognize when patients have kind of developed the eye manifestations of this autoimmune thyroid disease? Uh, thank you, Andrea. Um, well, as you mentioned, uh, the presentation can be very heterogeneous, but you know this, the most common clinical signs are uh, lead retraction and edema, which is usually something appearing very, very early. And it is often accompanied by the proptosis, which, you know, this protrusion of the eyeball forward is really mm -hmm. something that the patient tend to realize, to notice and report very, very easily. And um, um, often the, uh, the, the, the first sign is also something related to some diplopia that appears maybe in some awkward position of the head, not necessarily in the primary position, but patients sometimes complain in the morning, they wake up for the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes, until they, they get up, they sit double. These are very early signs that we usually, um, uh, we have to pay attention to these signs because it's often this is really the early signs and this might be the time that you really start monitoring and, and to decide for how to approach the treatment because we know that this disease is sometimes rapidly progressive and, uh, you know, the early you, you, you diagnose the disease, more tools you have, the more tools you have to treat the disease. That's such a keen insight. So first thing in the morning, worsening symptoms, particularly swelling and double vision. I completely agree with that. Ed, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the second question, and you can certainly touch on the first question as well. What common eyelid changes do you see in patients with thyroid eye disease? And how do these eyelid changes relate to the underlying mechanism of thyroid eye disease? So, so as uh, we, we all know, lid retraction, both the upper lid and the lower lid, is the most uh, common sign, eyelid sign in the thyroid associated retopathy. The mechanisms of upper lid retraction, sometimes it could be the uh, uh, sympathetic overdrive in the, in the uh, uh, from the hyperthyroidism. Uh, some people also talk about fibrosis of the superior rectus and the levator complex. And uh, also, if the patient has inferior rectus restriction, that may be, be causing uh, some of the upper uh, lid retraction. Uh, many of the patients, they have the lid retraction more on the temporal side. They get a bit of a temporal flare. And uh, we all talked about the uh, lid edema that's especially uh, more prominent in the morning, but, but due to uh, just dependency. And uh, uh, as you mentioned, with the uh, glycosaminoglycans that you get in orbitopathy, they, they have a, they imbibe a huge osmotic load and they make the cells swell up. There may be venous congestion uh, from the increased orbital volume, also causing uh, a lididine. I completely agree. I also have my patients, I have um, many patients that complain that their eyelid crease has changed or there's an asymmetry in the eyelid crease, or maybe they think one eye is droopier than the other because the retracted eyelid is so mild, they think it's the opposite eyelid that's the problem. So really listening to our patients and really um, understanding what they're complaining of sometimes can help us to diagnose this disease very early. Let's move on to the uh, third question here. Uh, what signs and symptoms indicate a thyroid eye disease medical emergency. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw this one over to you, Mario. Um, how, do you, how do you tell when a patient you know, really needs to be um, treated emergently for some type of sight-threatening disease? Well, sight-threatening sight disease sometimes is very um, subtle and uh, it's not really something so easy to diagnose. But you know, patients often help you because uh, when you ask them, uh, if they had, you know, they complain sometimes of having blurred vision. So then you go on and usually what we ask is, uh, do you see the same red that you, that you used to see before? Is your, the, the red color faded? This is one sign that is very, um, and I would say very sensitive to that. And patients are able to detect the difference in that. And the other thing is that often they complain because they have pain 
really behind their eyes when they when they raise the their, their eyes so in in uh, in the upward place they really complain about pain these are very uh, these are symptoms that have to be uh, really looked into they're very suggestive of something possible in terms of sign um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky. I, I work in a joint clinic with my colleague ophthalmologist. So when, when we perceive that there is something like that, then the whole workup is done by the ophthalmologist. They're certainly um, checking vision, uh, performing CT, CT scan or uh, MRI of the orbit to see if there is some sort of compression of the optic nerve, but also um, performing visual field examination. <coughs> These are all things that help. And we do use also color testing for screening and they tend to be very sensitive too you know so there are ways to be the, the most important things is to take your time with these patients because this is something that doesn't necessarily appear so clear like having the cl classic inflammatory uh, thyroid eye disease with edema and proptosis some patients some of these patients do not really have a relevant proptosis so even that has to be looked into with more care. That's such a great insight from a non-ophthalmologist that you are able to identify potential sight-threatening disease based on color vision. We know that color vision is one of the most sensitive and earliest uh, signs of optic nerve compression or damage. So it's really nice to hear from a non-ophthalmologist that anybody can at least assess for this concern and then quickly refer to an ophthalmologist for a complete workup. And Ed, um, if you can maybe add to that, and what types of things do you do to work this up? Well, um, yeah, one thing I neglected to talk about before in terms of the signs is that the amount of asymmetry that she can have. So uh, thyroid associated arthropathy is usually a bilateral process, but it can be very, very asymmetric. I, I, I think you touched on that when you're talking about the lid crease stuff. In terms of the dyschromatopsia, like, what can you do at home? We, you know, uh, patients may tell you, hey, uh, when the sun sets, the red doesn't look the same in one eye as the other, or the color TV set, uh, things don't look the same. I mean, the other thing I pay attention to a lot if a patient's trying to get back into the clinic, and this, like if they develop new onset double vision, especially on awakening, uh, I, I worry about that. Uh, occasionally, you'll get a patient with a really um, uh, bad corneal ulcer from, from their exposure, um, so as Mario mentioned about the pain, we want to be careful about that. The, the other thing which occasionally happens, which which I think is a relative urgency, is the patients get eyelid popping. Their eye can't go back in because it's so proptotic. So those patients I'll try to see uh, sooner. Uh, so did I answer the questions there, Andrea? No. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, so, many, so many ways that we can identify what might be a sight-threatening emergency. And then the final question in the 30 seconds that we have left here, what is the burden of disease for patients with thyroid eye disease? So more than just maybe their uh, sight-threatening changes, what, what other changes happen with these patients, maybe systemically or emotionally? Certainly, diplopia is a very important, um, it's a disabling situation. Maybe it is strange, and we know that then we can correct diplopia. But certainly, I, would, I see more patients complaining about that sign because they can mm -hmm. they can drive anymore they can function anymore rather mm -hmm. than maybe complaining because their eyes are particularly protruded so i think that that is the main the main burden when the disease is at that stage and i'll give you the last word yeah there's also a lot of psychosocial impacts too um um like feelings isolation anxiety depression it's a systemic autoimmune disease and has so many implications for our patients, but I think the psychosocial aspect is oftentimes overlooked and perhaps um, something that we really need to look into further for our patients. Well, that ends this module, and I really enjoyed talking about this with both of you. We're going to move on to the third module. We will now start our third educational module, Diagnosing Thyroid Eye Disease, What's Involved? Thyroid Eye Disease Diagnosis is typically made clinically based on a constellation of presenting signs and symptoms. And so we really want to find at least two out of the following three things to make this diagnosis. Clinical signs and symptoms, thyroid dysfunction, and classic imaging findings. So if you have a patient that has eyelid retraction, plus any of the following, you can be pretty confident that they have thyroid eye disease. So eyelid retraction plus thyroid dysfunction, 
you know, mo most likely they have some level of thyroid eye disease, or if they have eyelid retraction and the other classic clinical findings, proptosis, optic neuropathy, and large extraocular muscles and double vision. Now, if you have a patient that does not have eyelid retraction, but they do have thyroid dysfunction, and they have one of the other uh, of the bottom list, then you can assume that they have thyroid eye disease or at least have a high suspicion. So if they have thyroid dysfunction and classic signs and symptoms like proptosis, optic nerve dysfunction, or extraocular muscle uh, enlargement, then they may have thyroid eye disease, or if they have thyroid dysfunction and classic imaging findings. Now for patients that don't have these typical signs and symptoms, thyroid dysfunction, or imaging findings, then you wanna consider alternative diagnoses and work them up for other conditions. Ophthalmologists can confirm a diagnosis of thyroid eye disease and can assess the activity and the severity of the disease. But this disease is typically evaluated by multiple uh, colleagues, by endocrinologists, by non-ophthalmologists, and by ophthalmologists. So an endocrinologist or a non-ophthalmologist can do many things in their clinic to help to diagnose this disease. You can evaluate their eyelids for eyelid symmetry, eyelid position, and eyelid closure. You can look at the conjunctiva for the redness and injection of the surface of the eye. You can look at the position of their globes. Are they symmetric or are they too prominent? You can look at the movement of the eyes and are the eyes moving properly and symmetrically? And you can evaluate their vision, check their acuity, their color vision, etc. And if there's any concern for thyroid eye disease, you can send to an ophthalmologist who will do a complete ophthalmologic evaluation, including checking their vision, their adnexa, the movement of their eyes, and looking at the periorbital and orbital structures. That leads us to our panel discussion. And we're gonna talk about the process for screening and diagnosing thyroid eye disease. And so again, I, it's my pleasure to talk to uh, Dr. Salvi and Dr. Ng uh, about how we can screen and diagnose. So the first question is, what is the screening process for thyroid eye disease in at-risk patients? And does screening frequency depend on the patient's underlying disease? And I'm gonna give this one to Mario as an endocrinologist who sees these patients early in the disease. Well, as uh, already we mentioned in other discussions, but I think it's important that uh, to ask the patient with grave patients come to the clinic, they have graves, hyperthyroidism. This is, you know, the patients with the typical patient we see. And uh, we have to ask, do you have any eye, any eye symptoms? Because sometimes they, they overlook or they neglect these symptoms. And then a, a very easy examination can be performed just make sure that the position of the head is, is straight because some patients do not realize they are diplopic because they compensate by tilting their, their head in a certain position. So it, you put the patient with a straight head and you verify that the, you know, the eye movement are okay and there is no, there is no uh, diplopia in certain position of the, of the in certain direction of the, of the, um, in, of the eye movement. Uh, of, it is much, much easier to suspect uh, TED if you see inflammatory signs. That's certainly easier. But this is not always the case, especially at the beginning. And the one thing that we have to very, look very carefully is in, there are two typical, two typical situations for us endocrinologists. One is when the disease is unilateral, when we have unilateral proptosis. There, we really have to... Uh, uh, move on to some differential diagnosis or so perform some imaging because they may not be thyroid eye disease and we want to rule that out. And the second thing is that some patients do present with thyroid eye disease with no thyroid dysfunction. And this is the case sometimes of patients who come to us after having going around different clinics, both ophthalmological and endocrinological clinic, and, and the, the disease was not recognized. This is Usually, it, 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 it's, it's interesting because this disease uh, uh, is present in about 5-6% of patients with typical thyroid eye disease. And, and lately, we see even more of these patients. So we have to be, really be very careful in assessing the eye. For If there is presence of thyroid autoimmune disease, sometimes the disease may associate to Hashimoto's disease, patients with just hypothyroidism, and we do perform this, this kind of examination to all of them. That's fantastic. It's 
it's so important to work with our endocr endocrinology colleagues to properly diagnose and manage. And how about, Ed, I'm gonna ask you this question. What if the, a primary care physician suspects thyroid eye disease, maybe because of some eye symptoms that they notice in their clinic? Um, who should these patients be referred to uh, by our primary care physicians or our non-specialist physicians? And then does the severity of the disease affect who the patient should be referred to? Well, ideally, um, uh, you'd want to refer to someone that was oculoplastic, strabismus, or neuro-ophthalmology trained, if that was available in your community. And ideally, that ophthalmologist would be working in a collaborative clinic with an endocrinologist. Um, depending on where you are, though, like um, some places in Canada, um, the, the subspecialists are, are, are just too busy to do any screening, and they'll only see the patients that require immunosuppression or surgery. So it depends where your environment it, uh, is. But ideally, you want uh, oculoplastic strabismus or neuro-ophthalmology working in a clinic with an endocrinologist, uh, dedicated thyroid-associated or optopathy clinic. Great. I completely agree that the multidisciplinary care of these patients is key, and it's just important to find who manages this disease in your area and who feels like they um, are an expert at this disease or they at least manage this disease commonly and find that referral process so that you can easily refer patients. And that could be an ophthalmologist of many different subspecialists, subspecialties. Um, but also we do have endocrinology colleagues that can connect with their ophthalmologist. So sometimes you can refer to the ophthalmologist who will connect you with the endocrinologist. And you know sometimes that, that works both ways. Uh, Mario, I have a question for you. What are the main differential diagnoses um, that you consider when you're thinking about thyroid eye disease in your patients? And what do you do to rule out um, other diagnoses so that you are sure of this diagnosis, perhaps before uh, referring it to an ophthalmologist? Or do you just refer to the ophthalmologist from the beginning? Well, I mean, sometimes, if, if, if certainly, if I have the advantage of seeing that patient in the joint clinic, that, that's easy. That's easy. Because certainly when we have to dif differentiate diagnosis of TED, uh, we cannot, we endocrinologists cannot do without the ophthalmologist for sure. So what I was mentioning before, certainly in the case, especially the cases that are more challenging in which we, you have unilateral disease, I think it's definitely necessary to perform um, imaging. I mean, that is definitely the case in which uh, that has to be done to, to really make a, a precise diagnosis. There are some situations in which patients, for example, have some other ophthalmic disease, cataracts, for example. They have blurred vision because of cataract. They don't see well. So uh, as, an, as an endocrinologist, I would ask my colleague ophthalmologist to rule that out and to look carefully if that's really a decrease of vision that is related to thyroid eye disease or something else. So I think that when there is a differential diagnosis to be made, I think the ophthalmologist has the main role here and it, it can really tell me what to do. And I think I trust to him what he tells me to do or she tells me to do because I certainly have more expertise in, in recognizing different, different diseases which present maybe like a TED. So Ed, he just kicked the question over to you. So how do you uh, rule out the different uh, potential differential diagnoses for thyroid eye disease? Uh, well, a thorough history, physical exam, lab test. Um, if you have like a mild case of, of TED or beginning TED, maybe you confuse it with uh, allergic conjunctivitis or, or dry eye disease. But when things get more advanced, uh, uh, as Mary and you have mentioned, uh, imaging is essential. Uh, if you're going to order a CT scan of the orbit, uh, make sure it's non-contrast, no iodine. Uh, and, it, you know, mm -hmm. with your imaging and your clinical findings, you can rule out things like an indirect carotid cavernous stick I mean, these fistulas end up B60 episclerovenous congestion extending to the limbus. Uh, Postcal Myers patient may tell you there's a brewery. Uh, things like orbital inflammatory syndrome are usually happening much quicker, like 24, 48 hours of redness and discomfort, as opposed to uh, thyroid associated orbitopathy, and usually don't have lid retraction. Um, IgG4 disease is, you know, We've heard more about it in the last decade. Um, these patients may have super big muscles, but um, there's often lateral rectus predominance, or or you might get uh, superorbital inforbital nerve enlargement. Um, sometimes an orbital tumor can be causing proptosis. So Mary's comment about asymmetric disease, 
uh, 10% of patients with, with uh, tau don't have liver traction. So uh, scanning is essential there. And, and you also mentioned, Andrea, the thing that really scares me is occasionally you'll see cases of orbital metastases with scarce disease or what people might be muscles that really look like thyroid associated orthopathy. I think maybe three years ago, there was a case report in the New England Journal. At first I looked at it, I thought, oh, this is just thyroid associated orthopathy, but it's a, 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 a orbital metastases. And finally, because liver traction is, is so common, um, just in the back of your mind, if the eye looks more white than it should be, uh, could there could it be something like dorsal midbrain syndrome, paranoid syndrome? So I, I think the the points are so well taken. There are many things that can cause inflammation, pain, bulging eyes, and even double vision. And so it's so important to work with an ophthalmologist to uh, take the onus of ruling out other diagnoses. And then of course we manage these patients together with many of our colleagues in a multidisciplinary fashion. And then just quickly in the last thirty seconds that we have. Um, Mario, what biomarkers do you use for the detection of thyroid eye disease, especially early in the disease? Well, and as you mentioned earlier on, we do not have a specific marker for the eye disease. We, but we do have markers of autoimmune thyroid disease. And I think that if we have patients with markers of thyroid autoimmunity, I think that in a, an endocrine clinic, simply just play your role and just perform a very simple eye examination because, as I say, often the disease may not present typically with hyperthyroidism, that they may come later. So patients are still euthyroid, sometimes they're hypothyroid, so uh, the, 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 the mark, markers of autoimmunity are suggestive of a possible orbital involvement, and I think that is mandatory. I definitely agree. The autoimmune markers and doing the clinical examination and potentially imaging can help us to get to the diagnosis. It's been wonderful talking about diagnosing and screening our patients with both of you today. Thank you so much for your time and attention. This concludes the third educational module. Thank you.